Cool. Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, how are we doing over there? We are doing good. I, I'm in my new podcast room, and uh, I don't have all the decorations I want yet, so it almost looks like I have a, a, a white white screen in the back. Uh, so um, I got my setup. I had a little volume issue, so I'm good. This is uh, the second time we're recording in here, and 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 uh, I'm working towards uh, making it easier for me to get up and running. So, what about you, man? You are uh, actually not even you. It's it's this time of year, so we're recording this around mid September. A lot of entrepreneurs are getting that extension that they're asking. They asked for that extension in April, and now it's time to actually do your taxes. I imagine you're one of those. How, how's that going for you? It, it's been going well. One of the, uh, this is the first, 2021 was the first year I did a cost segregation, and it's awesome. <laughs> like, I can't say good, good enough things about it, just how much it's saving me off my basis. Uh, it's not for everyone, right? But for someone, the, you know, flip income is short term capital gains. You get hit very hard on that. Um, and so I, using that accelerated depreciation, you know, all you're doing is taking it and front loading it. Right. So if you're going to hold the property for a long time, it's better just time value money to take it now, offset those gains. I mean, it's, and, and, and on your basis, at least in my scenario, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars off the basis. Like it's a big deal. So it's, uh, I, I couldn't have been happier. I use cost side Kev. So shout out to him. I know we had him on the show. We can link to him in the show notes, but, uh, it, it's been, uh, Seen it on, you knew it was good. Then seen it on paper, like wow, I should do this every year. Did it take extra time uh, in the process, like the normal? Did you have to do more in in uh, just kind of some tangible items here? Like, what was your involvement in having to do this extra step here this year? You, you got to give them information that you already have, right? Like, you know, just the the rehab costs, some dates, when when was it occupied, like all information you knew. They have to go out do their study. You got to pay them for it. And then you need to go kind of go back and forth. Like, does this make sense? So like a little bit of time, but it, you know, it's 100% worth it. In my scenario, it was 100% worth it. Awesome. And in that question, I was able to Google up and it's uh, episode 59 cost side Kev. If you guys want to like listen. it when you ask a question, just to buy yourself time to look up an answer to something else. That's that is a, <laughs> it was, it was, it was you're on episode 170 and not episode three. It wasn't the plan, but I'm like, you know, oh damn, he's going to take a second. I'm, I might as well look it up and add value to the listener. So we did for you listeners. So, all right. What's our, what's our housing provider tip of the week here? Our housing provider tip of the week is something that's uh, near and dear to something that happened uh, in our own uh, property management company recently. Um, everyone in Chicago, you either for your, your everyone has electric for the most part uh, and you're using combat or for gas, you're using, either using Peoples or you're using NICOR. Now, all three of those companies have the ability for you to go on and log into their landlord side of things and put it in the system. So if the power or the gas ever goes out of whether it be the tenants or maybe maybe your your name for whatever reason, an accident, you are it'll automatically revert back to you as the billing and get you the bill uh, going to you. Um, and where this affected us this uh, this past month was we have a four flat in uh, Woodlawn that the we have a uh, it's a three flat with a, a, a basement unit. And the new tenant moved into the basement unit and they called up uh, People's Gas and they said, I want to move uh, unit B gas. They had their own separate gas meter for the uh, cooking gas and uh, the owner pays for the building uh, hot water. And uh, they put the building information in uh, into the new tenant's name. Now, the tenant ultimately figured out when her gas got shut off uh, a, f- a few weeks later and then she called up, she switched it, but that bill that went dormant. So... Yeah, it went about two months and the, uh, the, the owner just kind of been busy, didn't realize it. And it went off and all of a sudden I had four tenants without hot water. And then I had to call them up in an emergency situation. I had to justify the tenants why we had no hot water for two days because people's gas could not come out there for, you know, this happened like a Wednesday afternoon, couldn't get out to Friday morning. Then I had to pay someone to sit there between those crazy eight to 12 uh, type appointments and, and you have to get there a half hour early just in case they get there early. And there's a good chance to stay a half hour later if they're running late because you're not gonna leave at that point. But it was all a costly uh, scenario that could have been avoided if uh, the owner had their information in the landlord portal where when no, no matter all that stuff happened in the background and no one knew about it um, because the owner's paying their own uh, common area utilities, but it, it, all that uh, could have been prevented if they just signed up for that. It's all free through the utility company. So we'll put a link. Uh, I have specific instructions for all three utilities. We'll put a link in, in the show notes for people. Got it. 
Yeah, the, the less you have to talk with people's gas, the the better your life is. Yes, yes. And that was a long tip. Did you Google anything while we were while I was looking that up or anything? Nope. Focused on <laughs> focused on moving forward here. All right, all right. All right. Today's guest. So these guys were back on episode 112. It is a great episode. After you listen to this one, you should go back and listen to it. Spotting Chicago's development trends. If you like our podcast because we are Chicago specific, then you absolutely should check these guys out because they have data specific to Chicago. Uh, but our guest today. Highly active in the Chicago market and uh, market and networking scene. They've been around for over eight years with the goal to make neighborhoods, property, and construction development data accessible to all. They track demolitions, teardowns, business license, building permits, violations, and more. Uh, if you want to know what development's going on in a Chicago neighborhood, these are your guys to talk to. So we're excited to have City uh, Chicago Cityscape back on the uh, podcast. We have founder and owner Stephen Vance, along with their head of business development, Casey Smogala. Casey, I almost butchered it, but I think I got it right. Guys, welcome back. You know, right. <laughs> all right, we can take it from here. So, guys, specifically today, we're going to talk about the transit oriented development uh, in Chicago. So we're going to we're going to acronym that to TOD. And a lot of our listeners probably haven't heard about this, but it's something that every investor should know about. So let's start at the very basic building block here. Uh, Casey, what is TOD? What is the TOD ordinance that was passed? Uh, it was a new or it's an ordinance that's been uh passed already, but it's been updated for the third time that passed in uh, late July. That has uh, almost tripled the amount of properties that are eligible for the Transit Oriented Development or TOD bonus. And Stephen will walk us through the ins and outs of uh, all the all the policy implications. Cool. So just to be clear, this is a policy that's been around since whatever, 2013 or whatever it was. Yep. But now they've opened up the floodgates where a lot more, you know, parcels or whatever, however you want to define it, are now eligible for this. That is correct? Yep. So the TOD ordinance, um, also called transit serve location in the code, actually, has two main components. One is that it doesn't require as much parking uh, compared to a property that's not in a TOD area. And then there's a free density bonus in certain zoning districts uh, for properties that are also within a TOD area. And then what Casey was saying about how the number of properties that are eligible has tripled, that's because this year uh, the city added a bunch more bus routes to, to the list. So it had originally added bus routes in 2019, and now it just added a lot more bus routes. Um, and so that just, just totally uh, expanded the number of units, or not units, properties across Chicago that could take advantage of the TOD ordinance. What kind of properties, though... Like, is this if you're just doing new development? If you have an existing three unit, do you care about this? Like, walk us through some of the properties or, or give us a little couple tangible scenarios. So, a lot of people think it only applies to new construction, but it also applies to existing developments as well. And when you're changing the use of a development, so let's say that there's a daycare in a building right now and they're moving out and it's being switched to a bakery. So, that's called a change of use. And that bakery then has to comply with their parking requirements, not necessarily the parking requirements of the daycare that came before it. And so let's say the bakery, um, you know, has a parking requirement of four normally, but the TOD ordinance is like, well, actually it's two because you're right on this bus route. So now this bakery owner doesn't have to go and find four spaces when there were only two in the back of the property to begin with. Got it. So it's, it's, it, it's allowing these changes to happen more frequently now because it's one less box that, that needs to be checked. Yeah. And usually the planning department of the city of Chicago has advised business owners about it when, the, when they are eligible for it. But I think it also helps just existing property owners to advertise this fact when they're looking for tenants or when they're trying to sell their properties. Got it. And if I can jump in quickly, I think that that's one of the, major advantages to um, a broker owner or investor that listens to the podcast is to highlight now that their property is a transit served or eligible for the transit oriented development bonuses. So often it's an overlooked piece of data because it's small and obscure and not enough people dive this deep into policy like nerds like Steven and I, but it can really change the pro forma of a property if someone's taking advantage of these, um, uh, this ordinance. Awesome. Reminds me of uh, doing the industrial marketing when was it the T9 lighting came out and uh, that everyone started putting that in there. But uh, the so as far as 
who this can help or who this is helping. Can this help anyone like in the residential side that might be converting uh, a, a unit to become a, a legal fifth unit or, or adding a coach house or anything like that? Or is this going to be strictly affecting people on the business side? So one thing that the TOD ordinance revision of this year, which is also called connected communities, that what it added is some residential districts. So all the TOD ordinance versions in the past did not extend any of these benefits to residential zoning districts. And now it extends it to RM5, 5.5, 6, and 6.5 zoning districts. And so let's say that you find um, like a, like almost a mansion level house in, in Lakeview or Lincoln Park that has like 15 bedrooms and you wanna convert that into apartments, you would have to normally add one parking space for every unit that you, you carve out of this mansion. Well, now with this DOD ordinance extending the benefit to RM zoning districts, you would actually be allowed to build zero parking spaces for those units. If you don't mind, can you go through those uh, those specific zonings? What type of properties are for people that have the chart in front of them? <laughs> yeah, so R M. <laughs> All our listeners do <laughs> while they're so driving. The, so for let's let's just go with R M five. So I'll break it down. The letter R stands for residential. The letter M stands for multifamily, and the letter or the number five stands for the level of density that you can have. So it's more than a dash four, but less than a dash six. Uh, and the level of density directly correlates the number of units you could put in that building. Um, and RM districts are prevalent along the lakefront uh, neighborhoods. Um, so that's why I called out Lakeview as an example. Uh, and then, but it, it's more common to find an RT4 zoning district. So the parking reduction does not apply in an RT4 zoning district. So that's why I also picked an example like a mansion with ha that has 15 bedrooms that you could more easily carve up into, into apartments. Got it. W one quick side note here too, guys. We have on our website, it's free, the, the zoning cheat sheet. So if you want to learn more about that, Please, please do so. It's very important. We had one of the buildings we had, we were able to do a three unit to four unit by right, which I didn't even realize until the architect brought it up to me. So not to take us down a separate path, but under, you might be bored out of your mind. They, okay, RT4, RM5, who cares? It's a big difference, right? You know, when you're talking about the square footage of lot needed for per each unit, it's a, it's a massive, dis, massive difference on how that is zoned. And it could come into play and, you know, change the worth of the property by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Episode 97 with Samuel Palfovic. So uh, we talk a lot about zoning and all that. That's where that cheat sheet comes from. So look at you. Nice work. Um, you think what, I'm checking emails. I'm, I'm looking for episode numbers. <laughs> I, I just have memorized. No big deal. That's how much I care. <laughs> all right, so guys, one other thing I saw in here, I believe and I could have, I could have misinterpreted it, but you're also able to get one extra free unit. Um, if you build ground floor, uh, a ground floor accessible unit. Can you walk us through that? Because a lot of times I see these, you know, these storefronts that have a three unit above it. I'm like, man, if you can, if you can take that storefront and turn that into an apartment, all of a sudden we might be cooking here. Yeah. So this is what you're referring to is a way to increase the number of accessible dwelling units across Chicago. So we have a huge lack of accessibility, uh, accessible housing in Chicago. And one way to that the housing department thinks that they can spur more development of accessible dwelling units is by saying, if you build one, you can actually build an extra unit in your, um, in your building because we will not uh, count that extra unit against your FAR and your minimum lot area per unit requirements. So let's say that you are normally a builder of three flat condos and uh, you're, you can only do three flat in RT4 because you're limited to 38 feet in height. And so what this uh, ordinance does is like, hey, build a fourth unit on the ground floor. We'll let you increase your height. I think it's to 42 feet. Uh, and we, you don't need a zoning change to get that fourth unit. You don't need to do anything special. Just make it accessible. And now you have four units to sell. Um, and hopefully you'll promote that fourth unit, that ground floor unit as accessible so that somebody who needs a, an accessible unit is sees that listing and, and goes for it. And can you define accessible unit? 
uh, in I, pers- <laughs> I personally cannot define it. Uh, <laughs> it's more of a building code thing. So it's more about how the layout of the walls and the corridors and the kitchen are all designed. Uh, so it's not something I have an expertise in. Got it. But it's basically following the building. It's 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 building in a way that follows the call it building code. It's zone, I don't know if it's zoning or building, but whoever's making those rules, you're just complying with them. And then at your is it during the permitting process or is it during like your inspections? They're checking off and saying, yep, this is the way you want to do it. Um, during the permitting process, your plans would be checked to make sure they comply with the accessibility requirements in the building code. Got it. So free unit, that's big. Can I really mean, change the uh, the perspective on a property, can it? Yeah, and so this is, and now just to circle this all back, if so if your property is in one of these TOD ordinance, or one of these areas within the TOD ordinance, this is in play for you, right? Like if you if you're if you're finding a lot, you can run through that. You can end up with that extra unit. Yes, you're gonna have to pay a little bit more to get it accessible, but now you have four units instead of three. Pretty much, yeah. Um, another thing is that I'm, I'm rereading my my notes or my summary that I that I published on our blog, and it looks like you can actually get that free bonus unit as long as it's accessible anywhere in Chicago where there's the correct zoning district, regardless of the transit access. Um, and so the correct zoning district is one of RS3, RT3.5, and RT4, which two of those three are the most common residential zoning districts in Chicago. Got it. So the, another thing I saw was, there is there a deconversion ban in certain areas as well? Yes, and this is kind of a big deal. Um, so a deconversion, so I want to define that first. Uh, deconversion means going from a larger number of units to a smaller number of units. So a deconverting a two flat into a single family house is quite common in Chicago, especially in Lincoln Square North Center area. And what the connected communities to new TOD ordinance does is it says that if your um, house is in an RT or an RM zoning district, and it's in a, a community preservation area, which is part of the new affordable requirements or ARO standard that was adopted last year, and in a TOD, so it's got to have those three geographic requirements, then you cannot deconvert it unless you downzone it to an RS zoning district. So I did a some mapping and found uh, like tens of thousands of multi-unit, like two to five, two to six unit buildings across Chicago are now protected from deconversions. Now, not all deconversions are banned. Like you can go from three to two, you just can't go from two to one. Uh, in some districts, you can go from four to three. You just can't go from three to two. So it's essentially also setting a floor uh, or a minimum of the number of units you have to maintain on your property unless you uh, go and get a down zone to an RS zoning district. Got it. So that's good to know, because if you're sitting there on a two unit saying, I'm going to deconvert this to flip, and we've done several of those, and all of a sudden you can't, you better be happy with the numbers at, OK, I'm going to rehab this two unit then. <laughs> Which I I hope you keep it that way, you know, because I'm in favor of density. But the the alternative is to to consider the zoning lawyer fee and the time it would take to get that down zone. I mean, that's funny. So attorneys can get paid to upzone. I want my two to become a legal three, and now they can get paid to I want my two to become a one. The four of us are in the wrong, wrong line of business here, guys. It, it, exactly. Why did we not go into the, the zoning law? There's not much we could talk about on the show that the attorneys can't uh, help us with. So <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, can you guys walk us through maybe like a specific example where this has been in play? Because it's been around for a while, right? This isn't something brand new that we're all trying to figure out. It's just that they've updated the ordinance. So can, can you give us an example uh, of this actually in play? Yeah, we did some research um, through the Chicago Cityscape platform on four different neighborhoods, and we can actually run you through these numbers. Um, so we're going to talk about Auburn-Gresham, 
Albany Park, the greatest of all Chicago neighborhoods, uh, <laughs> Uptown and uh, Roseland. Uh, so in Auburn Gresham, that has uh, about 14,000 properties or pins, let's say. Uh, under the new ordinance, there's 11,796 that are eligible for the new TOD uh, ordinance or policy. Previously, there's only about 7,600. Now, so another, in, another four grand now qualify for everything we just talked about. Correct, correct. And now, all of those might not have the correct zoning. We're just talking flat parcels that are uh, eligible. Yep. Uh, now, in Albany Park, um, currently there are about 9,625 under the new ordinance. Previously, there's about 5,500. So you're looking at about another 4,000 uh, in Albany Park as well. Uh, looking at Uptown, not as big of a change or shift in Uptown at all, in fact. There's about 18,203 right now under the current ordinance and 18,154 in the previous ordinance. Uptown is also a very heavily transit served uh, location or, or destination already. And uh, Stephen will take a little bit of a deeper dive in the Roseland example, but this is where we saw one of the biggest changes. There's about 16,000 pins in Roseland. Under the current ordinance or the new and updated ordinance, there's about 13,110 that are eligible for the TOD bonus. Previously, there was only 2,200. So you're Got looking it. at a change in over 10,000 parcels in Roseland alone so, um, that are eligible. Real quick, Casey, real quick question, just to, sorry to interject, but if, if I'm zoned just to like a normal RS2, RS25, RS3, then does that mean I'm not qualified or am I misinterpreting this? So with Roseland specifically, and, and such a big jump in numbers, is that have anything to do with the, the new red line extension that's going to uh, extend past uh, 95th Street now? Uh, it has a lot to do with that. So our math or our calculation, our mapping does include the four new stations that would be built for the red line extension. Um, and which keeps moving along, like uh, every few months, there's an announcement like uh, we just achieved this milestone and getting you know, commitment from the federal government for so much money to, to help build it. And so now the city is working through a transit TIF to, to provide the local match to the federal government's grant. But uh, that aside, um, the city is also working on um, a stationary master plan for those four stations that coincides with this policy to, again, promote denser housing development near high capacity, high frequency transit service. So when you're spending uh, $3 billion, you want to you know make sure that people get, take advantage of it by being able to live close to it. Uh, and so the city has also selected Roseland to be an invest Southwest community area. Um, and so some things are happening with that. There's a new public space. It's going to be a new like park um, that's going to be built on uh, along Halstead, which is the main business corridor in Roseland. And then the Roseland Medical District has a plan to expand as well. So there's some momentum going on there that will make it more attractive to, to invest and to live in Roseland. Got it. And anyway, quick plug for you guys. So if I'm looking into Roseland and I'm seeing, okay, this is in the TOD, but if I have, you know, the cityscape platform, I can go in there and see it's also, you know, potentially can have this TIF funding. It's in an opportunity zone. It's part of Invest Southwest. Like that is all just everything that I'd want to know there is just right there for the taking. All the different opportunities, all the different, I'll call it incentives. Is that accurate? Tom, you just became our top sales professional at Chicago Cityscape. I'm, uh, I, I've, I've been, de I've been uh, demoted. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. I mean, the antithesis or the other side of that is your members and your listeners can, and they should, they, they can find all of this information in behind government portals or sometimes really expensive paywall protected sites. What we do is we centralize all of that information in about 147 other Chicago specific data sources uh, that Stevens aggregated over the past eight years into Cityscape. Got it. So everything's in one area there and you're, you're basically the curator saying here, here's all the information, here's the zoning, here's the possibilities, et cetera, et cetera. That is correct. The, 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 the RT, yeah, the red line, like there is a, uh, like we have a couple of properties that are right along the lines that we, they're, they're aggressive. They're calling us every day, trying to buy some properties up. So it, things are, things are really moving. I'm seeing from our, the, the private side of things of, uh, there's opportunity to sell some that land back. So it's kind of cool. 
And that to me is one of the encouraging things about the, pol the policy that the city is executing on now. It makes parcels and properties down there, I feel like more attractive to investors who may have overlooked it. And fortunately for the folks who live there, uh, it has the potential to increase their property value and potential as well. Well, just to piggyback on that, like even if you're like, well, I just invest in two units, I don't really care about this. You should care because if there's more development, more happening around you, that's going to affect the pricing of your property. Like you should be educated on all these things, regardless if you're going to be directly, you know, taking advantage of one of these programs or incentives. Like it still affects your net worth to a large degree. Uh, co correct. But unfortunately, knowing this much about a policy from the city is difficult for some people to either gain access to or to understand. So, I mean, don't mean to pump your tires here, but plug for the, for, for you two for having us on and talking things about policy, because, yeah, your mom and pa investor might not always dig this deep into what's going on with the transit oriented development ordinance. But it, is, it can have a major impact on the value of their property or where they choose and in, in, uh, or they choose to make an investment. Got it. So uh, let's circle back to parking for a second here. Stephen, we, we started going down that road. You wanted to mention one of the examples you had on parking maximum. Let, take us take us down that route. Yeah, so this uh, connected community use ordinance brings parking maximums outside of the downtown area for the first time. Uh, so downtown has had parking maximums that actually predate the TOD ordinance. So it predates 2013. Parking and maximums, before you go any further, that, that's... Uh... Define that or explain what that is. Good idea. Uh, so a parking maximum is a cap on the amount of parking that you're allowed to build. Um, uh, so downtown, it's like uh, if you're trying to build a 100 unit building, it's like, no, we don't want 100 parking spaces. And we definitely don't want more than 100 parking spaces. So the the rules downtown have, have capped it, um, I, I think, at like 100 at, at one to one. Um, and they're bringing that policy out into, uh, B and C districts. So that's business and commercial districts. And right now it only works or only applies to residential projects. And so the, in a TOD area, if you're developing a new housing, multifamily housing, you are now required to only build one parking space for every two units. So we call that a ratio of 0.5. Uh, if you want to build more than 0.5, you actually have to get permission from the zoning administrator through a process called administrative adjustment, which is a much easier process than before. And also, if you want to build less than uh, 0.5 parking spaces per unit, then you have to also get a zoning administrator's administrative adjustment. So it's kind of weird. So you're like, given this standard of 0.5 parking spaces per unit or one space per two units, and it says, if you want to build more, you have to get approval. If you want to build less, you have to get approval. It's just nowadays, the, the approval is a, is a slightly easier process. Um, however, there is a cap. So you are not allowed to build more than one parking space per unit, even if you get that approval. And so uh, I have one example of this. So there's a project under construction at the corner of Ashland and Monroe in the near west side. It is... It was permitted, and so I'm assuming it's still the same, to have 89 units and 116 car parking spaces. If it was, or at the time it was permitted, it was actually in a TOD because of the Ashland uh, bus route. So only 45 parking spaces were required, but an unlimited number of parking spaces were allowed. Nowadays, uh, if that same project was being permitted on or after July 20th of this year, it would not be allowed to provide um, more than 89 parking spaces. So let me do some quick math. So 27 of those parking spaces would now be considered like illegal or above the cap or above the maximum. And the developer would not be allowed to build those. Walk me through reasoning here. Like on the, on the North side, it seems silly because it's like, you know, oh, there's so much, there's not enough land and, and no one would ever even be able to do that. What's the reasoning on capping parking? Is this so that eventually more development can come there? Well, um, so parking is essentially uh, the main determiner of whether or not people drive. Um, if there is parking available, uh, people are more likely to own a car and more likely to use the car. 
uh, if parking is expensive or not available, then people make different choices. They either choose to not drive for that particular trip, uh, and some people eventually choose to get rid of their car because parking is is not available. So it's a small way to actually shift people into different transportation modes in the areas where there is already transit service available. I agree with that concept so much. And I can't believe they continue to just widen the expressways. <laughs> they only encourage more yeah. people <laughs> to drive and, and eventually it gets filled up and then they add another two lanes. And so it makes sense. Also though, thinking from the perspective of any like real estate investor or owner here. And so that's how we feel about like, like policy, right? But let's just think bare numbers here. What can you rent out for more money, a parking spot or a dwelling unit? So it's good and it's wise that the city is incentivizing and nudging folks to build more dwelling units and giving them the opportunity to build more dwelling units and less parking spaces. Because like I, we have an affordable housing, uh, I might go as far as to say crisis in the city of Chicago. Um, I care a lot more about having roofs over people's heads than parking spots for people to put their extra SUV. But you guys are perfect people to ask this question to. Usually the aldermen and the, the neighbors, the first thing they're always arguing is putting X amount of units in a particular space because it now creates all these different problems. Um, I, I feel like there's a, it, it ends up putting a ceiling to both parking and people and, and when, when you're doing that. Chicago used to have a million more people uh, 60 years ago than it does now. So I don't think more people is the problem. <laughs> So it's a perceived yeah, issue by the neighbors guess. that push back then is, is well, kind of what you're saying. And my, my personal take on just to interject is like, you know, if everyone's saying, you know, my streets are already crowded, our school's already crowded, I don't want anyone else here. The aldermen, whether they believe that's right or wrong, those are their voters, right? So if the, the neighborhood is saying that the alderman has a job to rewin an election, they're going to take that input into consideration, whether it's the right input or not, not try to get political, but like that's their job is to win, rewin their election. They're going to try to keep people happy. And, and this is a policy to say, well, we don't need 50 different policies. We need a citywide policy because some of these issues are the same everywhere. Uh, so the policy is you cannot build more than one parking space per unit in a TOD area because we want to make sure that uh, transit can actually, like buses especially, can, you know, move along the street. Um, unfortunately, we don't have many bus lanes in Chicago, um, but we need uh, people ride the bus because it's cheap. Um, we just want more people to ride the bus because then uh, uh, we would uh, better achieve our climate change goals and reduce pollution across the city if more people took transit and drove their own cars. Yep. So so you guys both have you know urban policy backgrounds, much, much more educated on this subject than, than Mark and myself. If you were in charge, you had a magic wand. Hey guys, go to town, make Chicago better here. Like this, this is a step in the right direction. What else would you do? Give us some ideas here of, you know, free reign, money's not an issue. How else would you improve the city, uh, both the affordable housing, everything we've just talked about today? Um, I would establish a municipal development company owned by the city of Chicago. Uh, the reason is that housing, when we rely on the market to, um, to build it all, there are cycles of new housing being constructed and then cycles or valleys of, of very little to no housing being constructed. Yet housing or people's need for housing doesn't necessarily follow uh, that cycle. So uh, with COVID, uh, we saw a lot of people changing their household formations, moving to different places, wanting different stuff. And there aren't the houses available for people to move uh, into those new situations quickly enough. And so then you see prices drastically increase. Uh, and, and a municipal developer is not trying to make a profit. Any profit that it makes goes back into creating more housing. And the municipal developer because it has different um, financial backing, like it's either you know bonds or tax money from the city or or from its own development sales, is not necessarily subject to competing with market developers in those same cycles and can constantly be building new housing. 
uh, even in times when the market may not support or like lenders do not want to lend to build new housing, but new housing is still necessary. So that's that's one thing I would do. Is that is that is that prevalent in other major metropolitan areas? Uh, no, it's basically uh, I think only exists in um, shoot uh, Montgomery County, Maryland has a municipal developer. And it doesn't mean that like it's not a public housing authority and it doesn't mean that this development company or corporation is doing all the development themselves. They can still hire out or contract other developers and GCs to do the bulk of the work. It's just now the funding source is the public and the public gets the benefit of the sale of the property or the rental income, except the benefit is that there is more affordable housing. And it's not like there are dividends paid to the to the citizens or the taxpayers. It's just that the, the money earned, uh, perhaps from the retail or from some of the market rate that they develop, just goes back into generating and building more affordable housing. I, I have to say, um, we've done, we're about halfway through this episode and we've done another full episode. I, I don't think I've seen your face light up uh, so bright and quickly. <laughs> by, and we, that was even a planned question, I, I don't think. And uh, you, you sound like you got that one, like you're ready for that one. Take that one on. <laughs> uh, I have one more that's like, uh, Bring it on, let's do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's uh, hear it. It's, it's like more. I wouldn't say more practical, just more uh, uh, easier to accomplish in the next year or two. Um, <laughs> in the TOD ordinance, before it was adopted in the discussion version, there was a provision to mandate three flats. And in, in TOD areas, there may have been another qualification, but that got struck. It was not adopted. Um, and it was essentially going to be a ban on single family houses in TOD areas. And I was totally in favor of that. Loved the idea that we're going to require three flats uh, in TOD areas because it is just a great way to ensure that more people have access to transit. Who, so who fought to, is that just like, who fought to get that removed, I guess? Like, where's the opposition coming from? Is it, is it just developers lobbying or like, because it would seem like, you know, okay, cool. It's a few less houses to flip, but like, who's the real opposition there to that? I don't know, uh, except that in internal discussions inside City Hall, that was a necessary move to gain sufficient support to pass the ordinance, was to Got remove it. that part. So there's an alderman that lives in one of these areas that uh, that's got a three flat that wants to turn into a single family home after he gets out of the council. That, that, that's it. <laughs> you nailed it, Mark. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What, what else do you guys see coming down the pipeline here, it, it, whether it be with TOD or, or similar ordinances that tie into this conversation today? Like if we were talking a year from now, what do you think is going to change from the policy perspective? What, what else should investors be expecting? That might be the most loaded question I've ever asked. So go ahead and take about 10 seconds to <laughs> digest it. Um, I'll we'll try to answer the, that. I'll we'll edit the pause. That. I'll try to answer that question and, uh, you know, what I would do if I were in charge. No, we only care about Steven. No, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I was say, the, the, first, the first thing I would do is appoint Steven over like <laughs> DOH, DPD, and maybe BACP. Um, but I, w what we're seeing more of, and I think the mayor has been very assertive about this, is driving investment that is kind of the ripple beyond Invest Southwest. Um, they, she's got these, well, she, I should say, the city has these 10 priority areas, I think that break down in 13 or 14 corridors where they're taking a whole of government approach on strengthening those neighborhoods and putting investment in development um, and hopefully business attraction there as well. Um, I talk to our cityscape members every day and they're always asking me, hey, give, give me that map of the Invest Southwest areas. Hey, show me where those corridors are. How do I draw a specific map around one of those corridors? Because that's where I want to look for property. Because as construction costs rise and difficult anywhere isn't a light lift, it's like, if you have the opportunity, why wouldn't you go where the government is putting all of their resources that is kind of the rising tide that's lifting all of those other boats there? So um, I, I see and I talk to a lot of our members who are attracted to the Invest Southwest areas, and I think that's only going to increase uh, in the years to come. And do you think they're going to expand upon that, like geographically, or do you think like... 
Um, I certainly hope that they do, um, but I'm not close enough to folks at City Hall. I tried to get a job there. I failed miserably. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know, but I certainly hope that they work to expand the, the policy and the areas that they're putting a whole of government approach into. This is a good question for you guys too. Like those areas, what does winning look like? You know, they have this whole city approach. Like how do they, how are they registering if they, if 10 years from now, if, if they accomplish what they're after? Ooh. Uh, I, would, I would love if the city did announce like, this is our 10 year goal and our 10 year plan and how we measure success. And we do that every day uh, in, in the private sector. It's working in the guys that in the, through the lens of we see a lot of development and a lot of construction now finally starting to happen and there's more RFPs and there's a large pipeline of projects happening there. Some ways that I would think to measure that is how many of your listeners then ride those coattails and go buy property in that neighborhood or how many folks open up new businesses uh, in that neighborhood? That's how I would think to measure success uh, of a policy like Invest Southwest or even the transit-oriented development ordinance that we're talking about. You can change the ordinance, but then how are we tracking what type of development is happening there as a result of it? To me, in the end of the day, I'm just thinking uh, through everything you're saying here, and we talked about there's that many less people here than there was uh, however many years ago, you said 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But it, to me, like it's, it's a people thing. Like This city can support the infrastructure of the people as now and probably not have to do too much if they add another million people. But if you add another million people, it would just put that much more money circulating it around and do so much good. And at the same time, uh, you'd probably be able to lower the tax base as well too, because you're going to add a whole bunch more units that are already on parcels that are maybe un not hit as potential as far as what it could, you know, the, the city's businesses uh, or county, however you want to do it, but the money that comes in, it comes from taxes, like whether it be uh, uh, retail tax or, or uh, property tax, like, isn't this game just about people? If we could put people in there that are spending money, so the mayor made it a goal, I think last year or two years ago, where she said, we're going to bring a million people back to Chicago. We're going to increase the population by a million people. And I, I love that goal. Um, I think Invest Southwest is a small part of that. Um, although I haven't seen a comprehensive uh, or connection of plans and strategies to accomplish that goal. I think she said in 10 years, um, because there's a, we have other issues to deal with that aren't housing related. Well, ever, actually everything's really related to housing because it's a basic human need. Uh, but like our schools, um, they're not you know equally good across the city. Um, and that is a reason that people leave the city. Um, and so I would like to see more movement on like tying the different strategies and the different planning processes into that goal. Uh, of getting a million people back. Because I think, like you just said, Mark, there are a lot of positive ramifications in the economic sense of it, um, as well as which could then um, make it easier to do things like uh, what the mayor's doing right now with the universal basic income for several thousand families of giving them a check of cash every single month to improve their well being. And we pick up so many more listeners, guys. That'd be great. <laughs> exactly. And Mark, the way you broke that down, I'll say that it's not too late to jump in the mayor's race, man. You, you've really got this. You, you know how to communicate this to the layman like myself. They're not running off a of quality KPI. So I don't know if I could function without uh, uh, minimum standards and uh, KPIs. Everything gets back to traction. <laughs> All right. Wrap this? Yeah, for sure. All right. So um, I will ask this to... Uh, Casey, and uh, how, what's your competitive advantage for Cityscape, Ben? How, how is your product? Uh, you could you could totally do a plug for for Cityscape right now, and, and why you guys are so awesome. But how is you, how have you guys been able to help developers like no one else has been able to? Yeah, I would say it's we are a software company, but we're in the people business. We're not a Silicon Valley startup. We're two guys who love and work in Chicago. And when our members need support on the platform, it's not uncommon that they call me at seven o'clock at night. Um, in addition to picking up the phone, we also centralize so much of the data that they need to answer questions that uh, impact the bottom line of their projects or where they locate their projects. I think other providers might do that, but uh, you're probably not going to talk to somebody who knows Chicago like the back of our hands like Stephen and I do uh, and take as much pride in the work and the data that we provide to them. 
Nice. So we tailored that one to the uh, to the biz dev rep, but we'll we'll do the rest of these to both of you guys now. All right. So Stephen, you can go ahead and start it off in case you follow up. What's the uh, one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Oh, Stephen, you check if first? it. Yeah. Um, check what the likelihood of it flooding is. <laughs> That's uh, how everyone's mine after Sunday. Yeah. Uh, after Sunday, oh my gosh, I was doing some mapping of all the people reporting their basements being flooded um, to 311, um, which doesn't really do anything for you except help us create a record of where the problem is. Um, but the problem was centered on in Portage Park, literally within the blocks around the park itself. Um, and so it's like, okay, does the city water department and the MWRD want to do an investigation and why that was, uh, but also like to go back to one of your earlier questions, I think that's a, a strategy, a land use strategy that the city needs to do a better job of addressing it, uh, which is, uh, urban flooding and runoff flooding, um, like we have the climate change action plan, which I think addresses it, but it's like a nominal uh, addressing. We have way too much impervious surface. Impervious surface means places where water cannot absorb naturally into the ground. Roads, parking lots, driveways are the main source of that. The secondary source is lawns. Like typical grass that people grow in their lawns does not absorb water really well. It, it does a thing that's called shedding where it just like goes off in sheets into the, into the gutter. So like giving people money to convert their lawns into uh, what's called zero escaped um, natural plants that absorb water better. And so to connect the dots here, if I'm going to buy a house, I want to know if it's been flooded or not. It doesn't mean I'm not going to buy it. I just need to know how much money I'm going to have to spend to resist flooding in the future. Like, do I need to fix some of the grading issues on the property? Uh, if I do a naturally landscaped um, lawn or yard, how much is that going to help? Do I need a bigger sump pump? Do I need a battery for that, that sump pump? Should I install uh, a perimeter drain uh, and so on? Steven, that is the craziest. What would you do you know, before you ever buy a, a property in Chicago <laughs> answer we have ever gotten? Like that, that was awesome. Like well, that, that, that was just well, so I, like way out there. Then and I just can't help, but like, you, you have such an awesome job. Like you literally were collecting data and, and running it against through on one and figuring out that that's awesome. I, I don't know. That, that was just such an awesome answer. <laughs> Steven, I think you just gave them a whole new episode. Gosh. <laughs> uh, so I bought my two flat in 2020. It's still in a gutted condition for reasons we're not going to go into. Um, but every time it storms, I go over there and I check to see if the basement's flooded. And every time it's been bone dry. And I don't know why. Like, it seems like it should be wet, uh, but it has never flooded. And I mean, I'm very grateful that it hasn't flooded. It's I just have to no finish idea why. It'll flood. <laughs> well, <laughs> in, in the drawings that I'm working with on or working to create, there is, I'm specifying a perimeter drain system because I also, I'm going to excavate the floor down to increase the basement ceiling height. And in that process, build out a drainage system. So it should be future proofed. Well, for all the people that don't have access to your data, I'm going to give a, a interim a landlord tip here, budget in about four grand for a backflow preventer um, in your basement. <laughs> <clears throat> My, uh, my wife who uh, bought an investment property in Albany Park is going through this right now. And it's about that price tag, Mark. So you, you know your stuff. <laughs> I, I would like to get that 301 data because I had a uh, one of my three units in Portage in the back like little laundry room. I had a tiny little bit of water, nothing in the actual unit. And I had a tenant like freaking out. I was like, dude, look at look in the alley. Everyone else throwing their stuff out. Like, you're good, man. <laughs> Relax. All right. It's all right. If any if any of your members want, send us an email and uh, 311 reports on basement flooding are one of the 147 data sources that we uh, collect uh, into Cityscape. So you can see if there's been a 311 report at a specific property or how many 311 reports on something like basement flooding have been recorded in Portage Park, Albany Park, or Hegwish. That's awesome. That's my favorite little segue we've done, I think. Yeah. Cool. I, I was thrown off on the questions. It's my turn. <laughs> 
what do you so we last time we talked it was wild it's just past uh we might have been even still kind of in the, the covet era but uh now now we're out and it's summer we're getting to the end of summer but what do you guys do for fun um i like to go to beer gardens it doesn't have to do it, with data <laughs> well I, I i like to go to beer gardens but i think i might have said that last time and um uh, I'm planning to go to one tonight. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I, it's a choice between uh, District Brewyards and Midwest Coast Brewing, both on the near west side. Uh, like, I don't know, the brewery district on the near west side. All right. All right. Casey, married man uh, now. Uh, uh, yeah, and now that I'm a married man, it's the first time in my Chicago life that I don't live in Albany Park. I'm, I'm, I'll always be an Albany Parker, uh, but I've consolidated apartments with my wife in Old Town. So you'll find me at uh, Oak Street Beach working out probably about four mornings a week, getting a swim in or doing uh, some type of like calisthenic exercise out there on the beach. I, I absolutely love it. It's awesome. Good stuff. All right, guys. What is a good book, podcast, or self-development activity? You can pick whatever one you want that you recommend to our listeners? I've got a good book because Stephen, you touched on the uh, municipal or uh, the, or was the municipal development corporation. Uh, Bruce Katz, who is an extraordinary urban planner uh, and economist, um, published a book, I believe it was in 2019 called The New Localism. And he talks about, I think it's Copenhagen who Stephen does uh, like a municipal funding arm for transit and development where rather than them selling land they'll lease land to a developer where they have transit so as that property is increasing in value that value comes back to the city and municipality so they can pump it into other public works projects so um, a new localism by bruce katz is a, an extraordinary book steven anything to add um so i didn't actually start listening to podcasts until i think the first time I appeared on this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think I've got like four now that I regularly listen to. One of them is called Housing Voices. It is produced by the Lewis Center at UCLA by Shane Phillips and his cohorts or yeah, co colleagues, whatever. Um, and they do something very unique in that they take a research paper and they read it and then they summarize it and then they bring the author of the paper to talk about it. And so um, it's not always going to be relevant to straight up Chicago investor podcast listeners, but like, if you really want to know the nitty gritty of why, you know, real estate transfer taxes have a certain effect on people's house buying uh, activities, the most recent episode would dig into that for you. I can geek out on that. Yeah, I could too. I could All too. right, we, we will link to both those in the show notes here. You can also just buy a house in an enterprise zone and have that real estate transfer tax erased. There you go. Boom. <laughs> That's a tip. All these tips. All right. Besides yourselves and Seascape, name in someone in your local network you'd highly recommend as a quality resource. A Liz Butler. <laughs> Um, Liz is uh, an attorney, a zoning attorney with Taft Law uh, in Chicago, and uh, she has the distinction of winning a zoning change against aldermanic privilege. Uh, last December, uh, a 297-unit apartment building was approved despite the older person's objections. Really? Is it? That's crazy. Yep. Because too many units. <laughs> How, I, I thought like you needed that in order oh, to get that. Well, well, you don't need it. There's no rule that says you need it. It's just, it's a, it's a deference thing. So like it's, it's a quid pro quo kind of thing. Like I'm not going to object. I'm an older person and I'm not going to object to your uh, zoning change applications or preferences as long as you don't object to mine. And so that's just how it has worked. That's what the privilege is. And in this situation, it's providing 297 apartments in the O'Hare community area, um, which includes more than just the airport, uh, next to the blue of uh, the Cumberland Blue Line station, which has 24 hour service across the street from a Mariano's grocery store. Yep. Like bringing housing in a much needed area. Uh, and 20% of those are going to be affordable apartments. And so 
the housing commissioner, Marisa Navarra, and the planning commissioner, Maurice Cox, both put their uh, effort or political capital into getting it passed. And so the zoning committee and the full city council overrode the local older person's objections. That's nuts. I, I know that area well. My dad worked at uh, Cumberland and Bryn Mawr for over 20 years. So right on the edge of uh, Chicago and Park Ridge there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Casey, who else to add? Um, I would say for any of your uh, uh, listeners, particularly on the investment front, the Community Investment Corporation, CIC, um, some folks over there are cityscapers, so we love them for that. But they have so many lending products and informational sessions and webinars to help folks that are buying their first property or buying their 20th property. And they have a lot of focus and emphasis in sections of the city that are way too often overlooked, but maybe shocking to some people have extraordinary cap rates. Um, so I say uh, the team at CIC is always uh, a good one to connect with, Community Investment Corporation. We've had three CIC episodes that I do not know off the top of my head. Nor I looked them up. We had Jack Crane, 45, Stacey Young, 94. I don't have the third one. I just, those are the two that popped Jessica, up. Jessica Simmons was the third, and, and I don't remember which episode, but she was well, That was recent. recent. We'll just do yeah. one she, she is a rock star. <laughs> she is. She's <laughs> awesome. Casey, you and I were talking with her at the recent soiree. We had a good, good conversations going. Yep, yep. Awesome. And we're going to be uh, featured on a webinar with them coming up uh, next month. Awesome. We got a lot of links to send out. So guys, thank you so much. You provide a ton of information to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Yeah. I mean, anybody who wants to engage, um, you can check out our website. It's just chicagocityscape.com. There's plenty of links to send a direct email to me or to sign up for a free trial of our platform there as well. We work with I would say hundreds at this point of real estate investors, buyers and sellers and developers, as well as community economic development leaders across Chicago. Good stuff. Mark, we got a Chicago fact. Who are we playing for? We are playing for, I wrote it down here, Jen Brown out of Burr Ridge. Buy a t-shirt. A lot of t-shirts. So I'll, I'll take a lot it. t-shirts. They run big. If you're in between <laughs> sizes, get it one, one a little smaller. It's a tri blend. I love that. I'm I not actually, I, got, I got the black one here. Nice, nice. nice. All right. So this in, in Chicago, the public parking system under Grant Park, Millennium Park, and East Monroe, so all three of those, they consider one parking system, is self-acclaimed to be the largest underground parking system in America. I know we'd be talking about parking today, so I thought I'd throw this one in there. So again, not just Millennium Park, not just Grant Park, but that those two and the East Monroe one. It consists of roughly how many parking spaces? And your options are... 1 point or 1,100, 3,100, 6,100, or 9,100 spaces. 9,100 spaces. I'll go with D. I go with C. C. Casey, go ahead. You guys go and C. Mark, this might be a first time the guest didn't get it, but you got it. All right, there you go. It's it's roughly that they're all like it's like twenty two hundred, thirty two hundred, and like three thousand. They're roughly about three thousand each, um, for for each one of those lots. All right, Jen Brown, we'll send you out your t shirt, or we'll send you out your your fifty dollars. Thanks for buying the t shirt. We'll send you out your your fifty dollars gift card sponsored by Renovo Financial. Good stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Great show, guys. I want to have you guys back on. And again, definitely me and Tom have talked about uh, doing neighborhood specific shows. So I'm excited about that. Uh, Casey, thank you as always, Stephen. Thank you as always, Tom. Another great show. Uh, listeners, um, if you guys have, I, I, we begin more and more, so we definitely appreciate it. But if you have ideas for shows, ideas for guests, if you have questions you have, send them to us. Because if you have that question, there's probably a lot of other people, thousands of other of our listeners that have that too. And we're looking for content and you're looking for value. So uh, we can see where those two roads intersect and uh, create a win-win. So Stephen, Casey, thank you very much. Tom, thank you as always. And listeners, we'll see you next week.